Hey guys, in this week's Casually Criterion episode, we're going to talk about Francis Ha. But before that, we're going to talk about Tenet, uh, WandaVision, and Synchronic. Nailed Synchronic. it. Synchronic. So get ready. Casual Cinecast, powered by Cinelinks. My name is Chris, and with me as always is Michael Haw. How you doing today, sir? Doing well, you know, I'm just trying to keep that spunk up and make it in this big world. Dancing to the beat of your own drum. That's right. <laughs> also with us is Justin Ha, who needs no drum to dance. That's true, but it's only because I'm very undateable. <laughs> it's very true. Or that makes me very undateable. <laughs> whatever all right if this is your first time listening this is a casually criterion episode which is a criterion focused episode that we like to do usually every other week where we review a film from the criterion collection that is voted on by the listeners but before we get into the main review we will be doing the usual news on the march section where we talk about recent news and things that we've been watching since the last time we recorded so if you have not seen francis ha you can still listen, and then we will move into a main review, a spoiler section, everything. This week, again, Francis Ha, spine number 681. That's right, and if you want to vote in our polls to choose our next Criterion film, uh, of which there will be a poll at the end of this episode that we will uh, announce and pick the choices for, uh, you can follow us on Twitter at Casual Cinecast. You can also follow us on Facebook and Instagram at Casual Cinecast, but we put the poll out on our Twitter, so that's the best place to follow us. You can also message us in any of those places if you have any questions or topics you want us to discuss about the movies we review each week, or you can email us at casualcinemedia at gmail.com. And then, of course, if you haven't done so already, you enjoy the show, you want to help other people find it, Go on to iTunes or whatever platform you listen to podcasts on and give us a five-star review and say nice words about us and let people know we're a good show worth listening to. Please and thank you. If you feel that way. I'm not saying we're a good show worth listening to. Yeah. You that may would feel be, different. Uh, yeah. But if <laughs> that so, would be cocky. Yeah. A five-star review and some criticism would be the best way to do it. <laughs> True. <laughs> but anyways. All right, guys. Are we ready to just get on with the show and move into News on the March? Yep, I sure no. am. All right, let's do it. You on the mark. All right, so Chris, why don't you get us started with what you have been watching this week? For sure. Uh, in the never-ending quest to watch as many movies from previous year in order to do our top 10 list uh i've been watching a lot of movies that aren't quite as big um but you know we're kind of did a blip on the radar that i wanted to make sure i checked out before we did our top 10 list next week and one of those movies was a movie called synchronic if you remember justin the directors of that movie justin benson and aaron moorhead did the endless that we watched a couple years back now mm -hmm. that we weren't super impressed by but i like the ideas in it I, like it was kind of like the execution of it didn't work out quite as well as I hoped. Yes, I remember that and I remember that feeling very well. <laughs> yes. Well, what I will say is in Synchronica, it's you know, of course got the same directors as The Endless, uh, Justin Benson and Anthony Moorhead. It's starring Anthony Mackie and Jamie Dornan from Fifty Shades of Grey fame, which Jamie Dornan is like the best name ever. I don't know how you guys feel about that, but Jamie <laughs> Dornan is like the name that the Fifty Shades of Grey guy would have already. I have no opinion on that name. <laughs> Anyways, uh, we're not reviewing names, we're reviewing uh, movies. What I will say is, like, halfway through this movie, I thought that this might be on my top 10 list for 2020. These two directors have been working kind of, like, on the periphery of Hollywood and, like, scrapping together, like, money to make their movies. And this really is, like, kind of a culmination of, like, they actually have money, they actually have stars. This is them kind of getting their chance right yeah. i imagine that they don't have to they don't have to act in the movie themselves right right uh they actually have actors <laughs> you know but they also have I, the thing i like about them so much and even with the endless uh that i really like so there's like this weird catch uh there's always like this like in the endless uh there are a bunch of guys that um are from a cult and they have to go back to the cult in order to you know just kind of like 
re-figure stuff out. And then there's like weird stuff that happens in the cult, you know, that's science fiction-y slash horror-y. And I, I like that that hook. Also, similarly in this, there, uh, Anthony Mackinney and Jamie Dorn play two paramedics, much like Bringing Out the Dead, that uh, there's this new like designer drug that they are seeing and running into. And there's like this mystery and there's like science fiction and horror that mix in here as well. And it's just fascinating. And then it kind of devolves in the second half for me where it's not it's it's not good enough to make it my top 10 list but i do recommend watching it and i think that <laughs> both of you guys should check it out because it's a movie that i would love to talk about with you guys just about what works and what doesn't and because i do think there's plenty of stuff in here that works so that's my pitch for you guys to watch it, I probably didn't nail the pitch, but I, I do think it's really <laughs> worth watching. Um, so, yeah. yeah. So, uh, from what I see here, it's pretty much only available to rent and not stream on any subscription service. So, I, I know that it's not making it into your top 10, but would you say that it's worth the three ninety nine rental price? Three ninety nine is fine, yes. I, nice. I don't know. We've also become spoiled with streaming. Like, I, it's a lot harder for me to rent something you know like if we were back in the blockbuster days it would be no sweat you know rent it but <laughs> you could probably wait a couple of months and it's going to be on a streaming service somewhere right so i would say yeah. you don't necessarily need to be in a rush so hopefully it'll be on a streaming service soon and then you check it out and we can talk about it yeah it okay. sounds like these guys have you know interesting ideas and maybe just so far, at least haven't got the execution right. And if they keep going, maybe they'll get it right. But their their ideas intrigue me. Like what you said, sounds like it could be an interesting movie. Yeah, I, I would agree. Like the execution somewhere doesn't work. And I think <laughs> if they keep going, that they're going to make one of my favorite movies ever because I love their ideas. Does that make sense? <laughs> yeah, and one of these days. Yeah, one of these days, it's going to be my favorite movie and it'll be totally worth waiting. <laughs> Fair. <laughs> You're getting in on the ground level with these guys, then. Yeah. You'd right. be a hipster, except you won't like have like their old stuff. You still would have only liked their new stuff, but I liked them know. when I hated their stuff. <laughs> yeah, I don't hate their stuff, but I liked them back when I was waiting for them to impress me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. What about so, you, Mike? Did I convince you? Um, I started the Endless back when you guys talked about it. I didn't make it very far into that movie, not because it was like unwatchable or anything, but. Uh, I just found that I wanted to do something else uh, quickly into it. Um, <laughs> this movie, yeah, you've convinced me that I want to watch it. I don't know that I will rent it before our, our best of the year episode or anything. So I don't know when I'll watch it. But like, if it ever does show up on Netflix or or Hulu or or Amazon, then yeah. I plus I like Anthony Mackie. Uh, yeah, I, I want to see that guy in more stuff because I think he's really good. But uh, I don't really see him in that much good stuff. You know. Yeah, he was actually just in the uh, Outside the Wire uh, from, on Netflix, which I haven't heard good reviews about, but he is definitely getting out there. But both yeah. him and uh, Jamie Dornan are really good in this and really elevate the movie, whereas like The Endless didn't have that like good actor. They had decent actors, but they didn't have those actors that elevate the material, right? Right. Well, there's right. some actors that can pull off dialogue like effortlessly and you don't even think about it as like really simple dialogue, you know? And then there are mm -hmm. some actors... Whenever they say something, no matter what they're doing, you're like, yep, they're acting all right. You know, <laughs> yeah, like, no matter what. I feel them acting. Yeah. And that was my experience with The Endless. So um, I'm sure at least that aspect will be much better in this. And, uh, you know, like I said, I like the cast. So I'm down. And I would like to get in, uh, like I said, on the ground level of some up and coming directors that, you know, may be like a, a hit soon. Right. I also would not be surprised if either one of you guys put this on your top 10 list. And I wouldn't be mad about it either. Like, it, it, you know, it just didn't work for me. But it is a possibility that it could be on your top 10 list. So Sure. I mean, these sure. guys could be the next Safdie brothers. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, I'll give it a shot at some point. Um, but I... Uh, are we ready to move on? Yes. Okay. I have been watching um, something a little more mainstream. I believe you have been watching it as well, Chris. And that is the first official... MCU Marvel television show, and that is WandaVision that premiered as we record this. I think the fourth episode will be out like in a few hours, but uh, as of now, there's three episodes that exist, and this show is different than what <laughs> I thought it would be. <laughs> yeah. What are you thinking about this show so far, Chris? Uh, before I dive into my thoughts, what are your thoughts? Yeah, 
you're right. It's different. And so there's a couple of like ways to look at this. I think it's fascinating that the MCU can do something like this weird and goofy. And I, it makes me very excited for the rest of like the Disney Marvel TV shows because they can do weird things that they can't do in the movies uh, that I really liked in WandaVision. I, I find it really fascinating that they're just kind of going on in a completely new direction. You know, like, This wouldn't be a movie, right? No, I mean, like, there are... Okay, so there's three episodes of WandaVision so far. And I would say if this had to be, like, edited down into a movie form, everything we've seen so far would probably be cut down to, like, 20 minutes or 30 minutes. Yeah. Like, yeah, like, each episode so far is, like, a different decade within, like, a sitcom. And for, I don't know, 20 minutes at a time, we are actually, like, in legitimate, like, sitcom antics. Where, like, there's a plot, where, like, they're having to keep some kind of thing from being discovered or, you know, um, someone, someone got drunk accidentally. So they're like, you know, they're getting drunk and trying to like act like they're not drunk kind of sort of. And you have like these legitimate old school tropes that like would be in a Dick Van Dyke show or a Brady Bunch type show, you know, like Mm -hmm. these weird plots uh, that are just mix ups and, and dinners where you have to impress the boss. You know what I mean? Like stuff like that, that is just such a, I don't know, could seem completely boring, I think, if you weren't in the right state of mind watching it. You know what I mean? Like if someone wants to come in there and they just want like Iron Man divided up into like 30 minute episodes, this is not that, you know? Right. Well, I, and I guess kind of my drawback, I, I think the thing I, like they should have released all three episodes at the first time because that's really I think the third episode has like the inciting incident and it, and it got me excited. Like after I watched the first two episodes, I was like, this is interesting, you know, like, and I'm glad yeah, they're doing it. it was more of a head it. scratcher, yeah. Yeah, I'm glad they're doing it, and it, but, like, that third episode, like, now you maybe have a little bit better footing as to where you are and what, what we're doing. I, I just really wish they had released all three episodes uh, to start off with, I and mean, they released two of them. So, yeah, it, it, it's interesting. Uh, well, here's what I'll also say, is so far, it's a lot more Lynchian uh, than I expected it to be, right? It's a lot more, like, weird eeriness, uh, spending a lot of time in things where you're like, why am I watching this? You know, like it's very much trying to build a mood up. But what I will say is by the end of it, I would not be surprised if it feels like in the last half, more like a traditional Marvel movie. That said, if they, if they keep it creative the whole time, oh, that'd be great. Like if they just keep it with this weird, like Lynchian mystery, uh, I have a feeling that by the end of it will be going back and forth between, you know, whatever's going on in the bit uh, the a plot. And then like maybe some other stuff too, that feels more like the traditional MCU formula. Agreed. Uh, and I also think, well, the other thing that's making me really excited about this is, um, I'm excited to see the, you know, the next phase of Marvel set up by this. Uh, I, I think that's going to be really interesting to see like the end of this. Well, there'll be a lot of clues as to what's going to come in, you know, in the next batch of movies and TV yeah. shows and everything. Yeah, it's going to be weird. And I also know that with this show, they're taking a lot of like MCU characters that have been sort of just one offs and a movie here and there. And they're kind of taking this like wide breadth of actors they have in their their canon. And they're actually kind of repurposing them to be used in TV show form. And I think that's smart. Not too many people have made their appearance yet in WandaVision. But like I know for a fact, like the uh, Randall Park, the, the FBI agent from the Ant-Man movies. I know he's going to be in this show to some degree. I know that, like, Kat Dennings from the Thor movies is going to be in this show somewhere. Yeah. So, you know, I think it's good that they're actually, like, these actors that have been sort of wasted in these bit parts that are, you know, talented, funny people. I think the MCU TV shows are where those people are going to really get their place to shine. I mean, an argument could be, an argument could be made that Wanda and Vision themselves were somewhat wasted in the movies and yeah. weren't given an opportunity to shine and this is that, you know. So Yeah, I, yeah, I like the idea of this show maybe retroactively making me care about those characters more because yeah, as it stands, you know, they were always the least interesting characters in whatever movie was taking place around them. Right. What about you, Justin? What's kept you from diving in or are you excited about it or how do you feel? I am excited. The only thing that's really kept me from getting to it is just actually sitting down to do it, right? It's it's something I want to do for all the reasons that Mike just said is, you know, wanting to spend a little bit more time with characters that we didn't really get to know that much or at least not as much as other characters and um, hoping that they flesh out some stuff and, and add even more 
depth and emotion and you know love for those characters into the mcu on a rewatch or you know if these characters uh continue on in some way in future uh cinematic theater movie mcu stuff (laughs) yeah yeah i mean with uh, the first three episodes with Wanda, and I won't get into too much here, but like we're already touching on things that like haven't been mentioned since like she made her premiere in the first Avengers movie that she was in, like Age of Ultron, right? So like, yeah. like they're actually like picking up threads that I thought they kind of forgot about, uh, and that's kind of refreshing knowing that like okay, they're basing her character on everything that's come before, and they're not just kind of forgetting about stuff or hoping the audience forgets about that one movie, you know? They're at least so far, they seem to be bringing it right to the forefront. Yeah. And I also think somebody, one of you guys told me, wait until the third episode was out or a couple more episodes were out and then binge it all. <laughs> so I had, that was one of the reasons I waited to, um, from when it like initially dropped. Well, I think Chris yeah, is yeah. right. I think you could probably binge the first three now and yeah. be interested in what's coming. Like I think the episode three ends with like the hook that really should have been the premiere. Yeah. Yeah, sweet. And these are like really short episodes. They're like twenty-two minutes long. They're not very long at all. Yeah, like Mandalorian um, length. Yeah, Mandalorian yes. kind of fluctuates though. But yeah, well, cool, cool, cool. So I think that's all we have for Wandavision as of now. Um, yeah, I'm sure we'll <laughs> touch base once Wandavision kind of wraps up and give some final yeah. closing thoughts. And by then, I will be caught up. I guarantee it. Cool. That's, <laughs> you heard it here. I'm not cutting that out. <laughs> Dang it. <laughs> okay. All right. Cool. So, Justin, I believe you watched something as well recently. Yeah, I watched something that is maybe just as mainstream or maybe even a little bit more mainstream than WandaVision. And it's something we've talked about on the show before, but I bring it up again because at, at the time only Mike had seen it and uh, Chris was, you know, on his sabbatical from the show. <laughs> and... uh <laughs> And now I have seen it and Chris, you have seen it as well. So I thought I'd bring it up just so we could kind of touch on it again, all three of us having seen it. And that is Christopher Nolan's Tenet. Ah, yes. Tenet. Yeah. So I I finally watched it a few days ago, maybe a week ago. I lose track of time as well. So I don't know, but... It's hard to know, especially if you're not sure if you're introverted or what. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Good one. I have nothing confusing to, like that. to say to that. <laughs> but yeah, um, so I, I doubt that nobody knows what this movie is, so I'm just going to go into my thoughts on it rather than describing what the movie is. But, you know, as far as Christopher Nolan goes, I think he's he's pretty hit or miss. And I was excited about this film because it seemed, you know, like a return to the Inception type of f- film, which uh, is a film that I'm a very big fan of. I think it's really good. And... um you know, probably not without its issues, but most of those don't matter to me because I have so much fun watching that movie. Mm-hmm. And um, I, I thought that this might be in that vein. And, and I think it is. I think it's an attempt to get back to that. But I have to say, and, and I think this is not the most unpopular opinion in the, in the world, so I'm not breaking any ground here, but I struggled with this movie to to stay interested in it, to to even like look back on like some of the things in it fondly. Like I, I was kind of you know, disappointed. And I think Christopher Nolan was on a pretty go- good run with like, uh, Dunkirk being really great. Was this, that was yeah. his last movie, right? Dunkirk? Yeah, I believe it was Dunkirk. And then before that it was interstellar. And then before that, I don't remember before that was dark Knight rises. Right. But, Oh wow. Yeah. He hasn't made that think, many movies. <laughs> yeah. No, no, yeah. Yeah. So interstellar had a lot of good stuff, you know, um, wasn't crazy about it, but you know, I liked the movie. Okay. And then Dunkirk was really great. So I don't know. I, I, I just I feel ultimately pretty disappointed in this one, mm. but um, and I guess the reason for that would be that you know I just found the movie ultimately like way too high concept to the point where like the rest of it couldn't wasn't even very fun <laughs> because it was just so complicated and complex that like yeah I, I couldn't really just have a good time with it and I was missing a lot of like the emotion and the character development that things like Inception or even Interstellar had. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think because we we have to spend so much time going through the sort of like high concept forward backwards time reversal stuff and understanding that, that we just like, we, we lose a lot of that heart. And um, 
and yeah, I don't know that anything happens that's cool enough to like make it worth losing that heart. And that's where I'm at. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so I'm pretty similar to you in that regard. I think I probably liked it better than you, but I don't really want to watch it again to find out if that makes sense. Like, yeah. Okay, so my experience with this movie was, you know, I watched it. Uh, there's like a, a a freeway chase in the middle of like the movie, or like forty percent through the movie, right? And yeah. it's a it's a chase that like is supposed to be intentionally confusing until like later on, and you see like another part of that same chase, and you're like, ah, that's what was going on, you know? And there yeah. were moments where I was like, I could like it was like a roller coaster for me, where at the beginning of the movie I was like, this is badly made, this is badly edited, I can't tell what's going on, I can very rarely hear them. Like, I yeah. don't really know what's happening at any given time. And then, you know, 20 minutes, 30 minutes would pass, and I would see some other scenes from a different perspective, and we'd get a little bit more explanation. And then I was thinking for a few minutes, I was like, oh, this movie's got me. Ah, oh, okay. This will be a lot more fun to rewatch, and it'll be one of those things where when it's over, I'm thinking about everything and recontextualizing it, and it'll be like this puzzle box that'll be fun to figure out more than it's enjoyable to watch the first time. Right. And then... 10 more minutes goes by and then I don't know by the last like third of the movie I don't even know what they're doing (laughs) like they're they're going to do something but I don't know what it is and then they get done with that thing and they're like I gotta introvert myself and it's like what are you why Uh, so (laughs) I don't know I don't like it very much I thought it was unnecessarily confusing and like you said at the end of it, like, I can kind of figure it out, but I I don't have anyone emotionally that I can connect with. Yeah. So, like, I don't have the urge to go back and find out, like, why they were – two teams were heading towards this one thing, and they were both trying to accomplish something, but I don't know what. Yeah. You know? And it's like – there's, like, there's some MacGuffins that you got to go get, but, like, I don't know. Like, none of it's explained in a way that feels very satisfying. Mm-hmm. I don't know. It, it's it seems very up its own ass. I guess is <laughs> is I guess my problem with it. Sure. So maybe yeah. as I'm talking about it, you know, I'm, I this is the first time I've ever really talked about it with a person. So I don't know. I think it's I think it's worse than Interstellar. I think so. Yeah, but... I think it is. I think I think maybe I don't like it more than you. <laughs> it doesn't sound like it to be honest. But I want to know because no. Chris hasn't talked about it yet. <laughs> Chris, do you have anything to add or or any differences of opinion? Uh, I don't know that I have a difference of opinion. Um, what I will say is that there's a car chase sequence about halfway through this movie. And until that point, I had no idea what was going on. Uh, this is one of the one, the few movies like I've seen since the pandemic in the theater. Uh, I did it very safely. I like went, I had the theater to myself, like at a matinee. Um, in fact, I probably had the whole theater, like the whole complex to myself. There was like nobody there. But I couldn't understand anything anybody was saying. So, like, I just thought I was missing all this exposition. And then about halfway through, like, I was like, oh. You're not, though. You're just missing them talking about nothing. (laughs) I get it. About halfway through. And then I didn't get it. It's like the concept of this movie keeps slipping from my mind. I'm like, for a second, I'm like, oh, I get it. And then I'm like, wait, do I? And then, (laughs) you know, like. uh, Yeah. Well, uh, I feel like I'm an average intelligent person you know so i think i should be able to understand it the other thing i kind of wanted to compare it to is memento when i first went and saw memento uh we had to drive all the way to dallas to go see it right and then the whole ride home we are talking about it we're talking about the characters we're talking about the the way it's set up the the way it goes backwards in time and then the parts that go forwards in time and we're all we're dissecting it and trying to figure it out and that's an enjoyable conversation i have not had an enjoyable conversation with anybody about trying to figure this out and i don't particularly care and i don't know if that's uh because it's me or like what it is like it's just too much like i don't understand i don't think i really understand what happened at the end um and I, I don't necessarily feel an urge to go find out, if that makes right. sense. Right. Okay. So um, I'm just going to throw the gauntlet down here. Spoilers for the rest of the conversation about Tenet. If you don't want to know anything about Tenet, that'll be the last thing we discuss in News on the March. Skip to uh, the main review. It'll be in your show notes. You have been warned. So there are things I did like about the final act and things that like I overall care about. Like There's evidence to, uh, to support that. Robert Pattinson's character uh, is Elizabeth Debicki's kid. All of a sudden, at the end of the movie, we discover that Robert Pattinson has saved his life like multiple times throughout the movie. 
like at the very beginning of the movie, uh, saved his life earlier in that thing and then ended up dying. You find out that was Robert Pattinson. And then, you know, later at the end of the movie, we get to see him go off to die, basically. And and I think he even knows it's the end of his timeline because of all the introverting, ex, you know, whatever you call it. So there is stuff there to discuss that's not explicitly stated. But that's all stuff that, like, you could just watch a YouTube video about it, and that's all the conversation you really need. You know what I mean? Like, it's not like Inception where it's like, whoa, you know? Like, I think it was very much trying to go for that, but man, was it, it was just too confusing. Like, too much introverting, too many, like, action sequences and too many set pieces. It felt like he wanted to end the movie with two teams going for one thing, but I think just made it more confusing. And... I also think Justin's really hit the nail on the head here. Like, if I cared more about the characters, I would want to go back and revisit this and dissect right. it. But I don't really care about anybody. So yeah, I'm yeah, not I mean, necessarily, like, going to go back and watch it again. I, I, I mean, I think there's attempts at that with you know, Elizabeth Debicki being She's got you a, know, kid. A, a psychologically abused woman with a kid who's in danger of not seeing her. But, like... It's also not really our main character that we spend the most time with. And yeah. And um, I don't know that we're with her as much as she's there and like what's going on with her is, you know, part of the plot. You know what I mean? Uh, yeah. mm-hmm. Versus, you know, Inception or, or with Leonardo DiCaprio or Interstellar with like Matthew McConaughey, where like the people with the emotional things going on are also our main characters. Um, and same with like, you know, that moment you're talking about, which probably was the best moment in the movie for me uh, of Robert Pattinson getting ready to go and go back through the thing one more time to, to save uh, our main character's life. And, and all of that, that that implies is probably the best part of the movie. But again, it's also with the character that's just been kind of a sidekick. Yeah. So, yeah, like I'm not opposed to having our our protagonist. That's even his name in the movie. I'm Hmm, not opposed to having the protagonist be a mystery or like a surrogate. Sure. But like, yeah, more than just Elizabeth Debicki needs some sort of emotional arc going on in the movie. Like, give Robert Pattinson more to do. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like if you're going to if you're going to have him kind of be like the puzzle piece to possibly the whole thing sort of (laughs) of timelines shifting and all the questions you have. Then like yeah, make him, make him a guy that we want to follow a bit more into the end. You know what I mean? Like like I yeah. don't know. So I yeah I agree. No one to care about really. Yeah, and and then sometimes with like these sort of like heisty crime movies, whatever you want to call them, like there's a value to knowing the characters' plans and watching them either succeed or fail or think they're succeeding and turns out they failed. And like yeah. There were so many times in the movie where, like, I think you said this earlier uh, to Mike, and it's that, like, I don't know what their plan is from the word go. Yes. So sometimes it's just like, I'm watching it. I don't know what's supposed to happen. And then when something does happen, then I have to figure out, well, was that what they wanted or not? And mm-hmm. so you don't you don't go on that journey of, like, wanting them to succeed and then them failing or, or Right. There's no Ellen Page to walk us through, like, which layer the dream we're in. Yeah. And, like, well, explicitly state the rules. They do have that moment where there's that exposition right before the big scene, but I still didn't necessarily understand what was supposed to be happening. Um, yeah, well, they, and they set up sense. stuff it's not like, clear enough. Yeah, Inception holds your hand in a way to where like it's not condescending to you, and it's also not confusing. Yeah, this well, one it, I don't think attempts to hold your hand as much, and and asks a lot more of the audience, which could be a credit to the movie for some people, right? Like I say it like it's a negative, but I'm sure someone out there appreciates how intelligent this movie assumes the audience is uh but i will say i watched it in a drive-in movie theater with no subtitles so i frequently couldn't see or hear what was happening (laughs) yeah it it felt like so many things got brought up of like you know that seemed like they were going to be plot details or like setting something up for later but i think we're just like well we want to get this sort of like cool idea in there you know things like maybe i'm wrong and misremembering now but like the whole oxygen masks are like well think you know, they set it up to be like this cool sort of like, well, when you're going in reverse through time, you, you're not breathing in. So you got to or something, the oxygen doesn't work. So you got to have oxygen masks. But like, to my recollection, the masks didn't play anything other than they just happened to be there. And then also with the the spinny rooms that send you back in time, whatever they're called, the little revolving things. And they set up that thing of like, yeah, if you're going in one and you don't see yourself 
coming out the other side as you're going in, then like don't go in or something. Yeah, and you're going to die. Yeah, it's like, I don't think that ever paid off in any way. Like It's been a while since I've seen it, but I, did, yeah. Maybe we saw Robert Pattinson do that. Yeah. Go I, in without I have seeing to say, himself come out. Maybe so. I would have to say, though, the masks uh, kind of also fit the plot so that we can tell the difference between who's going backwards and who's going forward. And you can so cover their yeah. faces so that they're a mystery later when you find out it's someone that we know. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> okay. So I, I think we've we've covered our thoughts about Tenet broadly, right? Do we have anything yeah. else we really want to go into broad strokes wise? I just wanted to nope. end on a positive note because I did really like some of the set pieces. I thought that they were like really well filmed. I didn't necessarily understand what was going on, but like, uh, yeah, I, I like some of the set pieces. So <laughs> we'll put that out there. Sure. It wasn't boring by any means. You know, there's no. enough entertaining action, you know. Yeah. Well, let's put it this way. I think there's a version of this movie that could be good. I don't yeah. know that it's the version that's the final cut that uh, is now out there, unfortunately. But like, I'm sure there's a remixed version where th- the dialogue is audible. There's some scenes maybe that he thought were too expository that he cut out. Who knows? But like, this movie's not a train wreck. It's just a movie that ultimately is like, it's such a highbrow attempt, like such a swing for the fence that like, I just don't think it paid off the way he wanted it to. Yeah, that's the thing is it, it's swinging harder. So the miss is, is you know, seems just worse, a louder yeah. whiff, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. But like this movie's better than, I don't know, uh, like any of the Fast and Furious movies I'm sure that I've seen. Right. So like, don't think that like I, you know, I say I don't like it. I and I, you know, might like something worse, better. I just think, you know, it's Christopher Nolan. So the bar is higher. That too. Yeah, that's definitely part of it. OK. All right. So that is the end of news on the march. So yeah. now it is time to move into our main review for Francis Ha. I ha. thought it was friend. I thought it was Francesha. Francesha Ha. Oh, Francis Ha. Tell me the story of us again. We are going to take over the world. You'll be this awesome publishing mogul. And you'll be this famous modern dancer. Play fight? I don't want to. Oh, it's super fun. I know when to go. Oh my god, stop it! Damn it! Oh, sorry, you have to like fight back. Stop it! I said stop! Oh, so sorry. I asked you to move in with me. You said no. But I can't. You can. You don't want to. What do you do? Uh, it's kind of hard to explain. Because what you do is complicated? Uh, because I don't really do it. All right. So as always with our Criterion films, they are typically older films, films that have been out for a while. So we will not be doing our usual spoiler free section. We will be giving our thoughts on the films that may include spoilers, may not. So consider this your spoiler warning. If you have not seen Francis Ha, pause the podcast, go watch the film, and then come back and finish listening or continue listening if you just don't care about spoilers. Okay. So Francis Ha stars Greta Gerwig in Mickey Sumner, the I- directed by Noah Baumbach. Sorry. The IMDb synopsis says a New York woman who doesn't really have an apartment apprentices for a dance company, though she's not really a dancer, and throws herself <laughs> headlong into her dreams, even as the possibility of realizing them dwindles. Yep. That's complicated. Yeah, that was a that was probably the most complicated synopsis I've read. <laughs> yeah. Also the funniest one I think that we've had on uh <laughs> Yeah, it's got the most personality. Yeah. <laughs> it's a journey in itself. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Appropriate cool. for the movie. I like it. Yes. Okay, so this film was one that I chose, so I will go ahead and kick us off, and I will be brief. Okay. This is, I think, my third Noah Baumbach film that I've seen. Maybe my fourth. And this is, I've seen Greta Gerwig in like other things like 20th Century Women, and I've seen her directorial films, but this is the first thing I think I've actually seen her as the, the main protagonist, the star of the movie. Mm-hmm. I think this is your fifth Noah Baumbach film, by the way. Is it my fifth? Okay, yeah. I think so. He is, what, what are the, okay, Marriage Story. Marriage Story, Greenberg, Squid and the Whale. Kicking and Screaming. And 
Margot at the wedding. Oh, yeah. Okay, 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 okay. And then this would be five. Okay. Well, I but, haven't yeah. seen The Squid and the Whale. Oh, I thought we watched it together, but I guess not. No, nope. we've talked okay, about never this mind. on the show. <laughs> Retracted. <laughs> How embarrassing. But no, Um. anyways. Uh. Yeah, but I want to go back and watch The Squid and the Whale now because I think Frances Ha is delightful. And I think yeah. Greta Gerwig in it is delightful. She is this, I don't know, spunky character that's like not really that talented and not really that good at anything but god bless her she's trying and she has dreams you know and she just wants to make it and she's not the most responsible but she wants to one day be responsible it seems like you know i don't know like she's so imperfect and she's such a mess uh but it's hard not to love her you know it's hard not to root for her and it's hard for her not to want to get her stuff together and like kind of make it even though i'd never got the feeling that she was going to (laughs) Um, so i don't know i think it's great i think the side characters are all really great you know it's like this story about something that i can relate with where it's like the older you get the more you're like i should really have my stuff together right now you know and you just don't (laughs) you know and that's how people perceive you and you know that's how they're perceiving you but all you got to do is just keep on keeping on you know to keep keep trying Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah. I, I don't know. I like it. What about you, Justin? You've seen this movie uh, actually the most recently <laughs> of any of us right now. So what do you think about this? Is it still <laughs> yeah. as good as you remembered? It is. You know, I uh, actually have kind of an interesting journey with this film. So this is my third time to see it. So the first time was around the time that it came out and it had it first dropped, uh, I think, on Netflix, um, like the same year that it came out, twenty. 12 or 2013 and um i loved it i thought it was fantastic uh, i'm a big french new wave fan and this movie is very french new wave in both look and spirit you know it just really in, in terms of like just the filmmaking in general i was just like head over heels uh, about the film and i watched it a couple months ago because a friend of mine was watching it and i was like well i'll watch it too and we can kind of we can kind of talk about it and I watched it then and I was like, yeah, that was really great. I don't know that I loved it as much as the first time. So I changed my letterbox rating from five stars to four and a half. And then Mm -hmm. I watched it this time and I thought, well, that was wonderful and great. And I looked back and I was like, four and a half stars. No, this is five. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. What an idiot I was two months ago. (laughs) Um, (laughs) Just a young fool. And I, yeah, I just I think watching it so close together, I, I really remembered a lot of the things that were going to happen and remembered a lot of the detail and, and it really all paid off in a really satisfying way this time that, that made me go back to just being like head over heels, uh, loving the movie. I, I love the way it looks. I love the sort of carefree spirit that it seems to be um, shot with and, and put together with that, you know, I know that it's a scripted film and I think from what I listened to uh, in the um, Criterion special features is that there was very, very little improvised dialogue. It was pretty much all scripted except for maybe like stuff with her parents when she goes to visit them because those are actually her real parents and not actors. Um, but the movie doesn't feel that way. It f- and that's a credit to, I think, Greta Gerwig's performance, all the performance of the, the side cast, uh, Mickey Sumner, uh, the direction of Noah Baumbach. I, I think that that it just feels really authentic and spur of the moment, uh, which I I really love. Um, I I also really think that, you know, to your point, Mike, Greta Gerwig is, is, you know, magnetic in it and she's really watchable and likable no matter how far behind the the rest of her friends and acquaintances that she is, you know, in terms of having her life together. But there's also a layer to this movie that's just, almost really depressing because you're watching this person not have their stuff together and kind of fake their way through it, but also be self deprecating while doing it and like making jokes about yourselves or like saying things that they really think and then being like, no, I'm just kidding. And I I think that I'm really impressed by the fact that this movie does stay so lighthearted while in a way telling a story that could be really dark (laughs) and depressing. And, and I like that it doesn't feel like a cautionary tale you know, against not having your shit together, you know, and, and kind of having its cake and eating it too. And like, you know, being about that, being about 
growing up and as your friends grow up and get their shit together Mm -hmm. and you are sitting there not and you know wanting to almost not wanting to in some places yeah well fighting tooth and nail against it but then like there's certain moments of clarity that the movie seems to have where she like understands like yeah she is a burden to her friends and yeah she is the friend who doesn't have her shit together and like the one that's like lagging behind everyone else and is missing that ingredient. It's like, she knows she needs it, but she's not ready yet. And it's just like arriving there in your own time sort of. Right. And like, sometimes you got to burn some bridges to get there or like make an ass out of yourself a few times before you really are ready. Or you feel like, okay, I'm in this place to, to do this now, you know? Yeah, for sure. And, and I, I will toss it over to Chris. Um, I, I just, you know, to, to what I was saying, like, I like that this movie doesn't necessarily condemn her for being that way, you know? Um, and that those all just make like a really much more complex movie that is also lighthearted and fun to watch. Um, and so that's why I really love it. And uh, so Chris, sorry to cut you off. Go ahead. Oh, no, that's all right. I was going to just kind of to respond to that, that you guys were talking about. A lot of her friends are uh, privileged you know like they have money you know like uh she has the the writer friend that's you know always just trying to write he doesn't really work he's just got parents that give him money you know so i don't necessarily think he's got his shit together you know or i I don't think her friend has her, her shit together you know necessarily i think this movie and this is why i think it's so lighthearted, or it can feel that way it's a celebration of life and it doesn't matter whether you have your shit together or not you it's all like a learning process and we'll get there at some point and we'll have ups and we'll have downs and you know uh that's kind of my feeling about the movie and just to kind of echo off of what you guys have said i think greta gerwig in this movie is <laughs> so delightful so really great that uh, she she makes the movie for me um I think there's a lot of other stuff that's really great about this movie. You know, um, I like the nods to French New Wave and stuff like that. But Greta Gerwig is... <laughs> I just love watching that goofball, Frances Ha, you know, like doing her stuff. You know, like there's that moment. And I think this will probably be what I remember from this movie. There's two moments, really. There's the moment where Adam Driver's hitting on her and like touches her shoulder. And she's like... Mah! <laughs> and I love oh, yeah, that yeah. moment. Yeah. And then there's this moment, you know, that kind of sets up the ending of the film, uh, but where she's at the party and basically it's like a, uh, a an elite d- dinner party, like a bunch of rich people are there and she gets drunk and she starts talking. It's like a really awkward dinner party. And then she starts talking about that one person in a party that you look at and you have your own little world, you know, and I, I those moments are great and feel great. And and I don't know, I'm sure another actress could do this, but like Greta Gerwig, I, I just like nails it for me. And I, I, I'm i excited to see more stuff from her. Like this is one of those happy accidents because I haven't seen very much of her or like I've seen some of the Noah Baumbach stuff, some of his early stuff, but I get to go back and watch these things and I'm super excited to do that. Mm-hmm. I, I actually <laughs> I was really excited because I thought you'd watched Greenberg. Uh, you'd put on the show notes Greenland and I, for whatever reason, I misread <laughs> it and saw Greenberg. I was like, oh, oh boy, we get to talk about that. But uh, anyways, I I love this film, and I'm right there with you guys on how great it is. So I want to respond to something that you mentioned earlier, Chris. It seems like, yeah, you're right. Some of her friends just sort of seem privileged. But as Mm -hmm. a result, they seem like they they still have their – their lives are a little bit more collected because they are privileged, right? It seems like a lot of times she's hanging out with these artist types or these rich elite types that like – she doesn't necessarily, I want to say she doesn't belong in those circles because, you know, anyone can belong anywhere, right? But it feels like she is surrounding herself with people that are maybe like unrealistic to hold herself up to in a lot of ways because she doesn't mm-hmm. have the same privileges. And she's trying right. to keep up with like their fancy New York lives where they're successful lives. And it's like she's scheduling trips to Paris she can't afford on a whim, uh, <laughs> you know, and it's like the most idiotic thing. And you're like, what are you doing? Like, and it's all for status, right? Like she wants to be viewed a certain way by these people. And as a result, it makes her become viewed even more the way she doesn't want to be viewed, you know, because mm-hmm. it's like her desperately struggling to lead a life that she doesn't have the means to do or the talent or the, you know, the husband or whomever, you know, like whatever, like her, like everyone's like tackling money in a different way. They're asking their parents, they're getting married. They just are, you know, 
Uh, and it seems like yeah. she doesn't want to compromise herself as much as any of these other people do. Yeah, I, I think, you know, her being our main character, she's our emotional window into this world. And so, you know, I think you're right, Chris, that maybe these people don't have their sh- shit together. Or, you know, I think it's debatable, you know, does getting married mean that you have your stuff together? Does, you know, dating a rich guy and being able to move to Japan um, and him being super successful, does that mean you have your stuff together? You know, uh, I think it's about her view of it, right? Is that all these people are doing those sort of things and they are, you know, able to afford uh, apartments for whatever reason, you know. And that's, that's where I think that comes from is like that feeling of everyone around me is, you know, turning into adults and being responsible, but I I am not. Right. Yeah. Like in her case, it seems like she's not even like on the right track to be doing that, (laughs) you know? (laughs) So, yeah. And I don't know that she wants to be, which I think is, you know, part of the movie, not necessarily judging her too much for it. Well, it's, I think a lot of it to me, the, and you know Noah Bombach may disagree, but the way I read it is it's not so much that she doesn't want to have her shit together, so much as like she finds herself at an age where all of a sudden everyone does, and she realizes that maybe now's the time to get a job. <laughs> now's the time to, you know, like everyone else just kind of fell into that, and then all of a sudden one day she wakes up and realizes she's older than she thought she'd be. And, like, her dream of, like, living with her friend isn't going the way that she thought it would. And people start getting ready to change and at different times, you know? So it's like, I think she wants to be there, but I don't think she realizes what that means yet until, like, her friend leaves her and all her other situations start to kind of unfold that way. Even, like, some of the the opportunities she has to make her life easier, but not necessarily um, be on her own, right? Like there's a couple dudes in here that probably would have loved to have taken care of her for mm-hmm. a little while. And she doesn't want to be that. She doesn't, she wants to be her own person and like live her own life. And, and so I think a lot of this is like her, uh, de- determining to herself, like what being a single woman trying to make it on her own looks like. And by the end of it, I think she's got it. Or at least she's on the, much more on the right track. Yeah, I think she's, you know, accepted that she's not going to, you know, go forth and be this great dancer and make a ton of money. You know, I think she's accepted what she needs to accept. But, you know, I think her personality is still one that, you know, she's not necessarily caving in and giving up on everything, you know. So I don't know that it's yeah. like a downer ending no, she, I'm not saying she's that you're still, saying that it is, but you know, yeah, she's definitely still pursuing her passions. Like she's choreographing stuff and it's, a, yeah, I, I felt like it was a happy ending on that, that note. It is. I, I love that. We get to see her do something, you know, um, because I, I think even though it's lighthearted, so much of the movie is just like her life not going as inspe- expected, you know? So I love that we do like end on that sort of upswing and get to see, you know, that maybe she she wasn't the best dancer. We see that throughout the movie, right? Like, I don't think she comes across as even as talented as the people she's dancing around. No. But when it comes to doing the choreography, like, I, I think that, you know, there is talent there. Mm-hmm. And I, I enjoy seeing that. And even if it's not the greatest, uh, seeing her do it regardless of the result and like do it in kind of a worry-free way where it's not like her future or her financial means then uh i think that's it's really happy (laughs) it's really nice yeah i I also like that everybody that has been in the movie it's like kind of like a curtain call for the movie too because we we get to see Mm -hmm. everybody that's been in the movie culminate in this you know like watching her thing and watching a a success that she puts out there right and i I think that that's good yeah and it and you kind of get the impression that like yeah for the most part they're all pretty happy for her at least that's kind of how I read it. Um, yeah, nobody hates her, I don't think. It'd be she's yeah, such I a think, mess. I could see you right. could hate her, or you could just you're like, I don't want to live with her because she's not paying rent. But like, it'd be really hard to dislike her. I think. Yeah, except that one girl that she dances with, the one that she's like, she's <laughs> yeah. like, hey, have you ever play fought before? <laughs> she tries to like yeah. play fight her, and the girl's like, damn it, what are you doing? Stop. Yeah, oh, yeah. maybe she hates her. That's a good point. <laughs> she's she like, living here with like uh, about six ish weeks, five five weeks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's good. And man, I love that 
that dinner conversation. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, that's probably my favorite table. scene in the movie. Yeah, it's really good, and and it's one of those that's like equal parts funny and equal parts just cringy, like mm-hmm. seeing their reactions to everything she says. <laughs> Man, she's that trying scene so hard. We're like, she's like, oh, I'll be in Paris next week, and it's like the they purposely don't return her call until like after she's left Paris. Oh yeah, yeah. It's so it's... bleak, like on paper. Thinking about <laughs> it, it's so bleak, but it doesn't feel that way. Like, yeah, I mean, it's like her attitude and her her disposition throughout the whole movie kind of kind of carries. I feel her. like that Paris trip is something that would happen to me. You know, like uh, <laughs> you go to Paris. Uh, you can't sleep, so you take a, a sleeping pill, and then you sleep through, you know, the majority of your trip. Uh, that would be... Yeah, she, the, she likes that's up at 4 p.m. Yeah, <laughs> like the stores are closed by the time she gets out and about and is doing stuff. <laughs> she can't even, like, go shopping. That's so yeah. great. Um, I, I think her friend is really good, too. Mickey Sumner. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, she's <clears throat> She really walks that line of, like, you know, being able to pull off the the sunny, like, you know, hang out with Greta Gerwig and have a good time stuff. But then later on when she's like angry <laughs> or more adult or whatever, you know, and more serious, like pulls that off really well. Yeah. And, and she kind of fluctuates in between like the Greta Gerwig, like hyperactive, like personality. And then as she's supposed to be married and more serious, like she fluctuates between that, uh, like in the the college sequence, you know, we see her like get really drunk and, you know, uh, basically be like Greta Gerwig and not have her shit together, you know, like, so. Yeah. Without it feeling like two different characters completely that like, oh, well, there's been a 180 switch here. It doesn't feel that way. Right. I was about to say, you totally understand why the whole movie Greta Gerwig's like, we're like the same person. We're like the same person. And the whole time, me as an audience member, I'm like, yeah, but you're clearly not like you're <laughs> right. clear, like she's clearly like I want to say a better person, but she's clearly like a more responsible person than you are, right? But then you get scenes and like moments and every now and then where you're like, I understand why they are friends and how they probably used to be, and how Greta Gerwig still thinks of them, you know? But yeah, but her friend is like is like leaving her behind when it mm-hmm. comes to like emotional maturity and development. And, yeah. uh, yeah, I think it's, it's pretty fascinating the way it's played, right? Because Greta Gerwig, it hasn't really sunk into her yet the way it seems to sink into everyone else, <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. that, uh, that her friend is kind of moving on. Yeah. Uh, and, and I guess maybe it hits her the most when she's in college, you know, d- doing the like resident advisor thing and everyone's like, aren't you supposed to be like in college to do this? Or the, the girl's like. She's like, I used to go here, and she's like, I'm 27, and the girl's like, oh, like, kind of has this reaction of, <laughs> of like, why are you here? Yeah, that's <laughs> and pathetic. she's not allowed yeah. to take the classes, you know. Um, I I also really like yeah. just the depiction of that friendship because I, I I do think there are friendships that feel like breakups, <laughs> right? Because yeah. like the other person's moved on, like or is getting married or whatever, and it feels like a breakup when like you guys don't hang out as much as you used to, you know, like. Well, especially and when it, her life is very much like, hang out with my friend, renew our lease, and live our dreams yeah. together. Yeah. Right. Yeah, for sure. And I think there may be some codependency issues there, too, you know, type of stuff. But I, I also, I just like the depiction of these two girls that have a friendship that's not sexual, but, you know, it's a tough breakup, <laughs> right? And I, I think that those are things that happen in real life that's not examined very often in film. Yeah, and it's highlighted by what I believe is maybe other than the montage, but like the opening like scene of, or one of the opening scenes of the movie of uh, her with the, the, her boyfriend, the guy that she's dating with, like who's behind oh, yeah. the cats and wants them to move in together. And they kind of break <laughs> up and like, she doesn't quite realize it and they're not quite sure. And she's pretty emotionless to the whole thing. But yeah, obviously when this friendship splits up, it's, mm-hmm. you know, not the same reaction. So I, was, I, I like that we open, <laughs> open to establish what a, a romantic relationship breakup is like for her, which is right. not Well, it's like much. with her, it's like, like I said, her, her dream isn't even to like have a spouse. It seems her dream is to live with her best friend and, and like dance, you know? And, and it's <laughs> yeah. like, uh, I think like they're just completely different pages in life. Like I think, whereas like she enters into a relationship that she's not feeling a hundred percent about, it's just a temporary thing that will end eventually. And then I'll move in with my best friend or I'll move on with my best friend again. But her best friend's in a situation to where like, she's in a relationship where it's not perfect, but she's willing to like 
work at it and like make it into a marriage because she's ready to move on, you know? And yeah. it seems like, like I don't get the impression that the first dude that she broke up with was like a bad relationship. I think it's this one. She wasn't about to let herself take seriously. Like she wasn't yeah. even, there was no scenario where that relationship ended her taking it seriously. Cause she's just not there in life. Yeah. It's not going to be priority over her best friend. Yeah. yeah she enjoys being with her best friend more. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I love like the montages in this movie and the, and the way that, you know, at first they seem, they always seem kind of like fun, silly montages, but usually they take us on like an emotional journey more than I expect when they start. And I, and I really, especially like the sort of montage thing where, when she's home visiting her parents and how we go through <laughs> that whole sort of arc, like it could have been a large, large section of the movie and another uh, arc, but the way we cover it in montage and go from like, Oh, she's back with her family and she's, you know, visiting them and having a good time together and go through all of these events. And by the end she's, you know, she's in the bathtub and her parents are like kind of encroaching on her space and she can't do what she wants. And like, it's kind of like, ah, okay. The, the fun time is over. Right. Yeah. <laughs> like, I mean, that's part of being I'm, an adult, right? And going back I'm ready to, to your family. <laughs> yeah. Like I'm ready to go done and like <laughs> that journey in, in that one montage i think is really good mm -hmm. i agree yeah noah bombach is really good at just capturing the mundane in a very like impactful way i think like the the mundane emotions of everything like the mm -hmm. the emotions that like in other movies might be played for more melodrama it seems like in his movies are just kind of dry and flat but yeah. there's like a melancholy underneath it about it the whole thing yeah, it's it's the moment that Chris called out where, you know, Adam Driver is going to make a move on her and she goes and like <laughs> yeah. shuts it down. And we kind of there's there's a lot to that, but we don't dwell in it uh, narratively. <laughs> right. Yeah. You know, yeah, um, I like how like, Adam Driver didn't even seem perturbed by it. Like the next scene, exactly. he's with like another girl. <laughs> yeah. It was like, well, OK, that didn't work out for whatever reason. Yeah. <laughs> so like I, I did I, like. I, I thought he was going to be like a dorky Adam Driver character, like an inside Lewin Davis type. So I was getting ready to feel sorry for him. <laughs> mm -hmm. And then later no. on, oh no, he's like a, he's fine. <laughs> I like later on when he uses the same line, like want to see my room. And you just know that like, that's like <laughs> yeah. every time a girl comes over, he goes like, he says like the three lines, you know? <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah. That's good. I, the other thing that I really like too, is just these, the, the, there's like two moments and they're not necessarily there's the one running through New York where she's like skipping and hopping and, and doing all that stuff is so much fun. The uh, one to Bowie? Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, and then there's the other moment that I really like and I like, think it's just so funny and fun to watch her like try to figure this stuff out and that's the ATM moment you know like where she's running to try to find an ATM because she actually has oh, money yeah. for once uh, but she like for whatever reason they only take credit card and cash and she doesn't have any cash so she runs and tries to find an atm she's probably gone for like 30 to 45 minutes trying to find it she falls she starts bleeding you yeah, know just all yeah. sorts of craziness and i just i love watching her do that you know and i like this is the moment that we've all had too like the atm pops up and she's like does she want to pay the surcharge you know like it's it i don't know i, I just really love those moments yeah, that part was great where she had to really like weigh whether or not the surcharge was worth it after all of that yeah, <laughs> like an extra two or three dollars is like she's like, oh god, I didn't anticipate this. You know, like she's that broke. <laughs> yeah, that's probably an example of taking the super mundane moment and you know milking the drama and like what it says about a character from something as simple as oh, the surcharge fee. Oh, <laughs> that's like three extra bucks I thought I'd have in my bank that I won't have access to. Yeah. I feel like, and I don't know if I'll ever get to know. If this is true, but I feel like no matter how much money I have, I will always resent paying surcharges at an ATM. So, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I just think it's funny after she ran like 30 minutes or however long just to get there, right? Right, that was still like a moment of hesitation for her. She yeah. didn't, she didn't anticipate that question was going to be asked. <laughs> yeah, uh, well, that's the heartbreak of it, too, is right. Like, she's ran, she's offered to pay, he's waiting for her. Can she not accept the charge? Is there an option to not accept it? I don't know. No, I don't think so, really. And so there's a bit of a heartbreak of it, like inevitability. Right. Too. Yeah. I have one more thing, just something that, uh, you know, I thought about after the last time that I watched it, because, uh, you know, as I said, I watched it uh, because my friend had watched it 
and he wanted to talk about it. And he had asked me the question, you know, have you said, he said like, I enjoyed the movie a lot. Is it the one thing he's like, I don't really understand why this movie was in black and white. Like, why not just have it in color? And I'm, I'm sure there's other reasons, you know, for it. Uh, you know, there's definitely the, the nod to the French new wave that we've talked about, but in talking about it with him, my explanation or my, my theory was that, you know, Francis is going through all these different phases of her life and she's moving apartments, you know, from different sections of New York to another section of New York, like maybe a poorer part. And then also to this university. And then she takes her trip to Paris also goes to Sacramento. So she's moving all of these places, but you know, in terms of her life progression, she's kind of running in place. And I think it's a genius move to put the movie in black and white because it makes all of those places feel the same even though she's moving about different locations that I think in color would look and feel different. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, I mean, especially because it's like not even like a crisp black and white. It's like a very grainy gray, like raw kind of black and white where, Mm -hmm. yeah, like everything kind of does feel the same. So uh, there could be something there. Yeah. Works for me. Yeah. And it's kind of all about your own interpretation of it. And I, I do like, so I watched some of the special features too. And they, who's talking about, they actually shot it in color, <laughs> but then they, they changed it to black and white because it's like his first uh, digital film. So, yeah. and also his first black and white film, I believe. So like, he was like, I want to do this in black and white. So yeah, they knew they were going to do it in black and white from the word go, but yeah, with digital, you don't have the option to shoot in black and white. Like it, with film, you can be like, I'm going to buy black and white film and this movie right. will never exist in color, but with digital, yeah, you have to shoot in color and then strip out the color later. And make it black and white. Which can make some really wonderful black and white images, you know? Yeah, yeah. there's one thing he was talking about. I'm, I'm sure you saw this because it sounds like you watched the same things that I did, Chris. That he was talking about when they, they were in Paris, they were shooting on a street and they had mm-hmm. put these like neon colored rings of light that move up and down along the trees in the sh- street. And he's like, in color, it looked horrible. It was like just ugly and like not that good looking, but put it in black and white. And the, like all those colors just kind of turn into like light, and he's like, yeah. and it it looks beautiful. And um, yeah. yeah, I don't know. I thought that was that was cool. There, the the magic of black and white, you know. Agreed. Yeah. Okay, yeah. so does that's that all wrap I have up to our review of Francis Hall. It yeah, does. that's it for me. And did anybody's? Uh, I mean, I know we all really liked it, but you know. Is it is it growing fondly in you guys' mind when talking about it, or does it just kind of stay the same? I was already pretty uh, high up on it. Um, yeah, I mean, it's hard uh, for it to get much better in my brain, but yeah, <laughs> yeah that's fair. I'm, I'm, yeah. Si- I'm sitting at a comfortable four and a half. Yeah, for sure. I, I'm back to five, as I said. <laughs> <laughs> but even even at five, though, like it's just as I, it's one of those films as I talk about it, like I the fondness of watching it and and my fondness for it just grows the more I talk about every little individual thing. Uh, I understand how that would happen. Yeah. <laughs> cool. <laughs> but yeah, All that's right. it. Cool. So I think now it's time to move into our next Criterion picks to be voted on by the listeners on social media. Is that correct? You are correct. Okay. And I believe, Justin... You chose this upcoming theme, so why don't you go ahead and educate everyone? <laughs> yes, let me let me teach all of you a few things about what this poll is. It is <laughs> <laughs> it is uh, the theme is date night movie, and the reason being is that by the time you vote on this, it it we have a winner, and by the time we watch this and and put this episode out, about two weeks from now, the time you're hearing this, we're going to be either a few days before or maybe a few days after Valentine's Day. So I thought date night movie would be a very good choice, something that, you know, you could watch, you know, with your partner or significant other or, you know, yeah. um, it's too even bad just a, a first date, Sallow. second date. Yeah, I know. I, I figured, <laughs> I figured that <laughs> joke stole was coming. My joke. And there's, there's yeah. also I- ironic choices that you could choose. Um, so we'll see if these all actually end up being date night movies. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, Chris... Why don't you go with your first choice? Okay. I actually, I'm going to pitch you guys something. Uh, I've Uh got two choices. My first one is um, the Before uh, before Sunset. Which one's the first one? Sunrise. Sunrise is the first one. Sunrise, yes, yes, yes. Uh, So my pitch is, well, 
if we do before sunrise, I think we got to do all three of them. So yeah. we'd have to commit to doing all three of them now. I do have another choice. It's just one movie, but I'm, I haven't ever seen the before movies. So I'm hoping that you guys will agree to do the before trilogy. I, I agree yeah. to it for one reason. I got the box set last year and I still have never seen before midnight. Ooh, okay. Oh, yeah, really? we can I've seen the first two and I own the third one and I've never watched it and I, I don't know what happens. So, um, yeah, I would be down to do that. <laughs> yeah. And I, would I think agree we would that. split each one into like a, its own episode. So we'd have like basically our next three criterions planned out. Right. So, okay. Yeah. Well, I guess we would just put the before trilogy. Yeah. Yeah. yeah we'll, yeah, we'll yeah. put that as the, as the official choice. Yeah. And I'm You've totally down me, for that. I've seen all yes. three. So yeah. I guess I'm the only one. And, uh, I am willing. It's well worth our time to revisit all of them. Yeah, I would yeah. love to eventually. This would be the perfect excuse for me to watch the third one and also the other two again. So I like it. Good job, Chris. I hope it wins. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I think it's got a good shot. We'll see what you guys pick. All right, Justin, what you got? Oof. Um, I have a tough choice. I, I'll give you guys an option too. Do you want to go with a movie I've seen but didn't really get or fully care for but think it might be better on a rewatch or do you want to go with a movie i've never seen and i'm hoping is actually a date night movie and not something else <laughs> weird uh that, ooh, those are two good options so i'm gonna let you <laughs> go with your own chris, discretion chris what do you let's think? go with the um the unknown the unknown okay so that is celine and julie go boating <laughs> okay which is a, a film that just got announced pretty recently i think yeah it's spine number 1069 so it's really new um i don't even know that it's technically out yet no it doesn't come out till march but from what i'm reading uh, and understanding um it's a french new wave movie and a daydreaming library like i can and a daydreaming librarian <laughs> and an enigmatic magician meet each other and hang out and they go through a time warping adventure involving a haunted house, psychotropic candy, and a murder mystery melodrama. So it sounds very silly yeah. or very weird. Oddly enough, um, that sounds like synchronic. <laughs> the movie okay, I, I well, there you, about <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Um, but I don't know. It's a, a couple of people meeting and going through some weird, bizarre, trippy adventure, it sounds like. Uh, maybe somewhere, it sounds to me something like Before Sunrise Meets House. The Japanese movie, not yeah, the, I was the show. A little bit of house thrown in there uh, with that last little bit of that, that synopsis. Yeah, so I could be wrong, but that's my choice. Celine and Julie go boating. <laughs> All right. Okay. So go ahead, Mike. Yeah, mine. I'm just going to wrap it up with a pretty straightforward uh, rom com, one that I haven't seen in a few years, but I would like to, and that is Charade. Oh, oh nice. Yeah. yeah, Audrey Hepburn and one. Cary Grant. It is a film that is actually in the public domain and has been remade a couple times, but uh, nothing holds a candle to the original, uh, where Cary yeah. Grant is very charming and Audrey Hepburn is very charming and everyone is just having a very charming time. Yeah, it's just a delight. A great date night film. Yeah, I thought so. So, there you go. Um, again, those are The Before Trilogy and then uh, what was the two names? I forget the name of the movie. You... Celine and Julie Go Boating. There we go. I was going, I kept wanting to say Jack Goes Boating, that Philip Seymour Hoffman movie. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, not that. <laughs> and then Charade. So Nice. By the time you listen to this, that poll should exist already online, or it's over because you waited too long and listened to this after the first week. <laughs> Either way. Yeah. It'll all yeah. work Did out. Did you guys have any runner-up? Um, ones, uh, the other ones you want, just want to mention real quick, Chris, I want to know what your other choice was. Uh, summertime by David lean. Ah, oh, okay. Yeah. I want to know what Justin's nice. other choice was the one that he didn't like, but possibly wanted to like by watching it again. Yeah. Uh, that would be, uh, Harold and Maude. Oh, okay. ah, yeah. That, that okay. would That's be a, a good movie. movie. I need to watch again. Yeah. So yeah. I just think I just <laughs> didn't get it or know what I was in for, you know, and I think it'd be better knowing, you know? Yeah. It seems really I, great, you know, in hindsight, but I don't know. Yeah, it seems like, it, um, you know, one movie, I don't know why I thought of it whenever I was watching that movie initially, but whenever we watched Thoroughbreds, uh, I was thinking yes. of Harold and Maude when I was watching that movie for some reason, and I don't know why. It has the same, like, nihilistic tone to it, or, or I don't know, yeah. this sort of... Just really dark, twisted comedy Yeah. thing. 
Um, that's not exactly funny either. <laughs> yeah, and not exactly that dark. <laughs> it's just weird. I don't know. Anyway. Yeah. I had the same thought too. Totally the same thought. Wacky. So yeah, so and, and the, the show I talked about it. I talked about it a few weeks ago. The the Netflix show, uh, end, the of end of the fucking of the world. Thing world. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That that gave me Harold and Maude vibes to it at times. Yeah, it sounded so. like it whenever you were describing it. I was like, whoa. Cool. Hello. Awesome. Well, <laughs> <laughs> is that it for this episode then? Yeah, I think we're done. Awesome. Well, thank yep. you so much, listener, for listening. And then, of course, as always, thank you, Jake Wagner Russell, for doing our intro and outro music. If you want to hear more of his music, you can do so at soundcloud.com slash bopscotch. All right. So it's like I said, stay tuned to this channel. Our next episode will be the top 10 films each of 2020. So we are in a mad rush to watch everything potentially good that came out and we missed, which was a lot. So, yeah. Stay tuned to that. All right, guys. Uh, We appreciate you guys listening, and we will see you next time. Bye-bye. See you later.